doing is I can stab a wife with Mark in the maze. Probably Jenny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Oh, wow. Okay. Lots of nice colors, too. Okay. Okay, so um, where were we? Uh, we were in the midst of me getting everything horribly wrong. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, one thing that went horribly wrong last time was I was explaining um, this corollary of Banakaloglu, which was just that the, uh, uh, the unit ball uh, in a reflexive Banach space uh, is a bit compact. And um, it gave a sort of half-assed explanation um, involving um, uh, triple duels, and it was a bit confusing. So um, I think what I, I put in the notes now, um, two different explanations of this fact. One that just says, um, let's just identify. This is what everyone would usually do in, in functional analysis. Let's just identify x with x double dual. Pretend they're the same sets rather than isomorphic via j that embeds one in the other. Uh, and then we just say, well, you look at the unit ball uh, inside x. Well, that's the same thing as looking at the unit ball inside x double dual. And then that's, um, that's compact uh, by Banakaloglu in the uh, in, in this topology, uh, this topology, which is just so this is meant to say that the weakest topology on here, so that everything in here is continuous. That's that Banaka Loglu says that that the weak star unit ball in so the with sorry, the closed unit ball in uh, in Y star. compact according to this topology so that's all of the, the all of the linear functionals that come from y via j have to be continuous uh, but then you just sort of say well and this is exactly the same as as that because x and x star are equal and that's the and that's the weak topology okay. but then I also in a footnote in the notes gave a very long-winded version of saying this, where you refuse to say that x and x double dual are the same thing, you explicitly keep track of the isomorphism. And it all comes out, and it's in, arguably the second one is a little bit more correct. Uh, you do have to, it requires more steps when you keep track of the identification than just what's going on here. But in this, this is what you'd always see in a book if you want to see something carefully keeping track of J. Okay, so then, the other thing that went horribly long last time on Wednesday was that I was in the midst of, I, I, there was this proof that I said didn't seem to work, um, that, uh, that of, of Banaka Loglu, um, that tried to work uh, by mapping this guy via f to this product uh, over some dense set of these disks. And as far as I could tell when I went away and thought about it and talked to various other people in the department, that proof is really just bunk. It doesn't work. It's not fixable. <laughs> so we're not going to try and fix it. And I removed it from the notes. Um, and so let's, let's prove the proper version of Banaka Lovely. So uh, the, the first thing we need is, is Tychonoff's theorem, uh, which just is an arbitrary product of uh, compact spaces is compact. So let's, um, this is presumably not something you guys talked about any other time you've seen point set topology kind of things. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's prove this. So we're actually going to, it's, it's easiest I think to, to understand this if you switch to a slightly different notion of compact or an equivalent notion of compact. 
So say uh, a collection of sets uh, has the finite intersection property. Uh, if every uh, finite subcollection is compact if and only if uh, every collection of closed sets uh, with the finite intersection property has a non-empty intersection when you actually intersect all. And the proof of this lemma is really easy. Uh, all that you do is observe that um, it's really just you think about the usual definition of compactness in terms of open covers by open by covers by open sets, and you just take the complements of all the sets and the contrapositive of the statement, and, and you get to exactly this. So let's see. Uh, the point is that a collection of open sets with empty intersection is exactly saying that the union of their open complements covers the whole space, okay? And so hopefully you can see from that how taking contrapositives and of statements and complements of sets that this is actually just the usual statement about open covers uh, said in terms of the, uh, uh, the complements. Okay, so let's now uh, actually prove typing. And it's a... Uh, it's, uh, um, it's a bit of a fun argument. So, uh, so let's look at x, some product of x alphas, and each x alpha compact. Okay, so we're just going to use, we're just going to test this condition. So, uh, that f. Uh, do you mind if I sign? Okay. Sure, yeah, okay. So let F be a collection. Uh, oh, I mean, okay, yeah. Uh, closed subsets of X. And uh, we, get, we get to assume that it's got the finite intersection property. And our job is to prove that it really has a, has a non-empty non intersection. Okay, so now we do the first terrifying step. So uh, by zone one. There is a maximal family of sets. Uh, we forget about the requirement that they're closed, not necessarily closed, uh, containing f, so it's, it's, it's some family at least containing all of f, uh, and still having. Okay, so do people see how Zorn's lemma gets applied here? So you can talk about families of sets containing F that have the finite intersection property. Obviously, if you've got a chain of those that's increasing, just taking the union of everything in the chain gives you another family that's got this property. Um, because uh, because it, the finite intersection property is preserved, you can only take the union of an infinite chain because you only take finitely many sets, so there's some finite step of that infinite tower. So Zorn's lemma applies and magic promises you this maximal family of sets. Okay. Now, um, uh, two things to note. Um, uh, maximal family of sets is called H. Uh, so H uh, contains all finite intersections. That is, if you've got finitely many sets in H, throw in their finite the intersection of all of them, and that's still guaranteed to be an H, because if it wasn't an H, you could chuck it in, and both these properties would still hold. So uh, H must contain all of, all of its finite intersections. And also, uh, any set 
Wait a second. If we say H must be in H. Okay. So um, again, this is um, this is just by maximality. If you had an E set uh, intersecting everything in H, you could throw it into H. You'd still certainly contain F, and you'd still have the finite intersection property because that set you threw in wasn't going to affect that finite intersection because it would, because, well, I guess we already we have to make the first observation first before we can see that. Okay. Uh, so the, the point is that if you if you look at finitely many sets from the original H and your new guy, you intersect those finitely many, and that's still in H by this point. Then that set intersects that intersection, so the things there's, there's a point in the intersection of the finitely many plus the extra guy. Okay, so we get all of that. It's a crazy set. Okay. All right. Now that we've built H, let's do the following. So let's fix alpha for a moment, one of the indices of this giant product, and look at. Um, the projections into X alpha of all the different sets um, <coughs> in this maximal family H. Now, because any finite collection of these A's has an intersection, that tells you that an intersection of finitely many of these projections has an intersection too. You just if you, you've got finally many of the of A's, you forget that you've projected them, you see there's an intersection up in the total product space X, you pick a point in there, and you project it down, and that point is in the product of the projection. Okay. So this has uh, the finite intersection property. Okay. Uh, and by compactness, um, well, compactness doesn't tell us that these guys all intersect, because these guys weren't necessarily closed sets. Okay. By compactness, um, the closures of the pi alpha A's uh, have a non empty intersection. And let's uh, name that point, uh, let's just call it F of alpha. So let's do that now for every alpha. Uh, and so we get this thing that we'll just call f, which is the collection of all of the f of alphas as alpha varies. Uh, and that's a point uh, in, um, in this giant product. OK. And it's going to be our, um, our candidate, uh, the thing that we hope is, uh, is in the intersection of everything in f, which is if you remember what we owed. So how do we get there? Well, so let, let's um, say what we want to prove um, at this point. So we just want to prove uh, f is in a. we're going to do is we'll show uh, f is in uh, a closure for every a in the maximal family. But of course, since f was in the maximal family and the things in f were closed, that then implies the, the, th the, thing, the thing we're after. Okay, so what do we need to do to show this? Well, um, uh, the let's see, this would be what to say. Um, 
So consider now um, uh, some index beta and some neighborhood uh, u sub beta of f of beta in the space x sub beta. Okay. Now, uh, what we can say right away is that uh, if we've got any set in our maximal family, then um, actually this neighborhood u sub beta uh, intersect uh, the projection of uh, of uh, of this a, not the empty set. And why is that? Um, That is hopefully what we've just written over here a moment ago. Um, so let's see. So the old the alternative, uh, if it was empty, then we'd be saying that um, oh. uh, okay. Maybe maybe an easier way to say that. Let's um, let's say it that way. Oh, no, sorry. Um, no, it's the first. Sorry, it's the last one. <sighs> Can someone help this work out? Why that's true. Some neighborhood of f beta, and the way we picked f beta, oh, oh the, the way we picked f beta was that it was in the projection, that it was that it was in the closures, sorry, that it was in the intersection of the closures of all of these sets. I feel like we just need a picture here. Okay, so here we've got. And now, um, for any pi alpha, for any pi beta a, um, it can't be the case that pi beta a uh, is far away, because then f beta wouldn't be in its closure. So pi beta a has to come sort of arbitrarily close up to this point, and therefore, uh, for any open neighborhood of this point, it actually intersects with the. With, with pi beta a, okay? Uh, so that was that statement. And then this is just a taking the inverse image under pi beta here. Okay, so what was the, what was the upshot of that? That's saying thus uh, pi beta inverse of u beta uh, intersects every set in H because here A was just some arbitrary set in our big maximal family, and we observed that the maximality of H showed that anything that intersected every single one of those, uh, sorry, every set intersecting every single one of those had to, had to be in H itself. Uh, so we have pi beta inverse of u beta is actually one of the sets of this maximal family. Uh, H. Okay. Um, Okay, now H is closed under finite intersection, so, so any finite intersection of sets of the form pi beta inverse u beta uh, is in H. points of topology, what's called a neighborhood basis uh, for 
for <laughs> I uh, um, any urban neighborhood of F uh, contains such a finite intersection. This is and this is just this fact is just coming from from what on earth the topology on a product space is. Remember, when you've got some product, the, the subbasis for the topology are sets of this form, inverse images of open sets in a single factor, which means the basis for the topology are finite intersections of, of inverse images of open sets in a single factor, which means any arbitrary set, any arbitrary open set is a union of finite intersections of these things. So any open set around F contains one of these finite intersections, uh, which was in, in H, uh, and that's exactly saying um, thus F well this conclusion is right here uh, is in the closure um, of any A in H um, needs a little bit extra justification there. Um, let's see. So let's say F is not in the closure of some A. That means we can find some little open ball around F that doesn't intersect A. That little open ball then contains a set of this form, uh, which is still around F, but doesn't intersect A at all. Okay, but the set of this form was in H, and A was in H, uh, so they have to have uh, so they have to have intersection. So that was the two we found. Okay, um, maybe maybe I should write that step there. Uh, otherwise. We can find this intersection of chi beta inverse of u betas uh, containing f and uh, not intersecting a, and that's a contradiction because any two sets in H actually have to have an intersection. Okay, so that proved that. We proved that. Which proved this collection of closed subsets with the finite intersection properly had a complete intersection. Whew, which proved the whole thing was compact. Exhausting. Okay. So, with that in hand, um, uh, we, can actually, we can give a pretty snappy proof of the general version of Banach, a logo Um Oh, sorry, I raised the wrong side of the board. Oh. Okay. So we, we do what we started to do on Wednesday, um, but we do it better. Uh, so uh, for x in our, in our Bunnock space, uh, dx be this set of points in the, in the complex plane, uh, whose absolute value uh, is at most the, uh, the norm of x. OK, so that's certainly compact. Uh, and we let D be the giant product of these dx's. So the thing that we tried to do on Wednesday was only took this product for x in some countable dense set uh, in our uh, uh, in the unit ball. So I should say um, this is this is a product here over over x in the closed unit ball. Uh, but taking that countable product caused caused horrors. Okay. And so now we, uh, we define f, which goes from uh, uh, the ball in the dual space uh, to d, just by uh, f of phi is, so this is a, we're meant to get a point in this big product, 
So we have to say where all of its coordinates are, and the coordinates are just the evaluations of that linear functional. Um, at, all the, at all the possible points we can evaluate it. And it's pretty easy to see that because phi is in the unit ball, uh, phi of x is actually in the correct disk. Um, I did notice when I was scrambling yesterday to understand various proofs of Banach Ologlu, there was at least one textbook I found which screwed up at this point and just let these all be uh, balls of radius one um, and something will go a little bit wrong in the proof there. It's, it's a fixable thing, it's not as bad as what happened to us on Wednesday which was just really horrible. But yeah, I'm just saying this is an excuse that other people get Banach Ologlu wrong as well apparently. <laughs> okay. So, uh, great, okay, so uh, easily uh, um, f is injective. Um, my usual advice is never, ever, ever when writing mathematics use the words easily or clearly or obviously because it's a huge red flag that you don't know what you're doing. But in this case, it really is easy um, <laughs> because uh, obviously the value of f on phi here completely pins down what phi does phi is determined by what it does on the unit ball, okay? That's nothing scary in there. Okay, so now we're gonna do something a little bit funny. So uh, on the unit ball, uh, in the dual space, um, we have uh, the weak star topology. That's the one we're interested in, okay. So consider, uh, Instead, the weakest topology uh, making f continuous. Okay, so you, you might write this uh, as uh, this, this notation, this sigma notation that we uh, were using earlier, uh, like this. So it's the weakest topology on that set, such like that map out of the set is, is continuous. And we just want to show that actually that's the same as the weak star topology, okay? So what, what is the, the weakest topology that makes f continuous just means uh, take all the open sets in D and take all their pre-images under f and just take those sets as the open sets, okay? So, um, so an open set D with union Finite intersections of um, of sets of the form uh, the 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 inverse image of some open set uh, in a single factor. Okay, so uh, the the pre image of such a set. Is just all of the fees in the unit in the unit ball such that well what are we meant to do such that we apply f and then check that it's in this set so let's just write that out f of b is in pi x inverse g but that condition there is exactly just saying that uh, phi of x is in g Those were, uh, by definition of the of the weak star topology, those were the sub-basic sets of the weak star topology. Great. Okay. Uh, so these are the, uh, the sub-basic sets of the weak star. So we could say here that like sigma. Weakest topology making f continuous is actually the same as just the um, usual weak star topology uh, restricted to the. Oh. Okay, so if you've got an injective map, uh, 
Um, and um, you're looking at it on some topological space whose topology is exactly the weakest topology making it continuous. Um, we get to say thus f uh, is a homeomorphism. To its image. So um, thus is possibly sometimes a red flag word, like easily and clearly and obviously. Um, so let's make sure we really understand uh, why that follows from what we've identified about the, um, the topologies. Certainly, f is continuous with respect to this topology, because the whole point is this topology actually made f continuous. The question is why the, the the inverse image of f is continuous. So why is the inverse uh, continuous? And so for that, we just need to check, i.e., uh, why is f open? But you can see from this what's going on. I mean, the point is that the open sets are exactly the F inverses of open sets. So when you apply F to an open set, you just get the open set you stuff. Great, okay. And this was, the, this was the section of the proof that just fell down horribly when we only embedded in this, in this countable product. Um, and I think that it was just unfixable. Okay, so we're very nearly there. Uh, so we need to still ask, uh, what is the image? So uh, the image of f are just all of these, these tuples, such that the tuple comes from a linear map. And so the claim is it's exactly uh, the uh, linear elements of the product. Okay. If you have some giant collection of numbers indexed by x uh, that satisfy linearity, that is the value at x1 and the value at x2, where there's some linear relation between x1 and x2, uh, um, the values satisfy that same linear relation. If you've got something like that, then of course, that's exactly defining a linear function. So the place I'll just point out where some textbook got it wrong by just taking all these disks of radius one, was that then this step becomes slightly more awkward. It's then the image is exactly the linear elements which are bounded. The problem is if you, if you let these all be big balls, then there might be some giant tuples here that take an x of very, very tiny uh, norm to a complex number that's quite big, almost near one, okay? So you, you might get tuples in here that are perfectly linear, but, uh, um, but didn't actually come from a functional of norm at most one. That's actually fixable. You, you can, if you notice that you need that extra condition, you, the, the, the argument that we're about to use to, dis, to talk about linearity will handle that case as well. But anyway, good book, get back to it. Okay, um, okay, so uh, all that we want to do, we want to show uh, image f is closed, and that will complete the proof at that point because then we will have given a homeomorphism of the closed unit ball with respect to the weak star topology into a closed subset of something compact, and we win. Okay, so we just have this left to show. We want to show it's closed. So, um, so take some tuple Zn in, tuple is the wrong word, that sounds very finite, but take some element of the infinite product, uh, which is nonlinear. okay? Uh, we're going to prove this image is closed by proving its complement is open. So given this point outside the image, we just need to find a little open set that's still outside of the image. Uh, so the fact that it's nonlinear says, uh, well, uh, says that there exists, there, there's some linear, um, what's a good way to say? Yeah, there's, there's some, Uh, 
there's some linear relation all happening inside of the, the ball. So, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have written z sub n there, that should have been z sub x. So, uh, so z sub x is not equal to a1 sorry, times z sub x1 plus a2 times z sub x2. And if you're not linear, there's some particular place at which you fail to be, to be linear. Um, okay, and so, uh, and these, these, remember here, are all just complex numbers. Okay, so that epsilon, uh, let me not write it out again, just uh, be the gap between those two complex numbers we get on, on either side. And now we can just write down an open set uh, of things that are obviously not linear, because at that, at this same place, the, when linearity fails there, um, linearity still fails. So, so we can consider an open set uh, in D uh, consisting of these tuples, z sub x, such that, oh, I shouldn't have used, uh, can I, can I, I'm going to switch this x to x naught, just so it's different from the, the generic x. So it's all of the z sub x's. Um, uh, oh, and let me even switch to a different letter here. Uh, I should have made that z a y or something. Let me switch to y here, okay? So it's all of the y sub x's, such that, uh, y sub x naught minus z sub x naught is less than epsilon. Uh, y sub x1 minus z sub x1 is less than epsilon. I think we've got to divide by a1, multiply by a1, divide by a1. Yep. Uh, and uh, y sub x2 minus z sub x2 is less than epsilon divided by a2. And probably we better throw in some numerate, some denominators for good measure. Since epsilon is the gap, let's do divided by three, three, three. Okay. So uh, first of all, why is this an open set? So this is an open set in D just because it's an intersection of specifying values at, at, at three, in particular three is finite, many points, specifying those values are, are in some open set. So that's sort of an open set in D, and all such points are nonlinear. Just uh, plug those estimates into these guys being at most epsilon apart, and you see that replacing the z's here with y's, it's, it's still not true. Okay, great. That, I think, finished it. The image was closed, and so we produced our, our, uh, our homeomorphism to something compact. Great, okay. So we can finally, after that long slog through Varakaloglu for almost two days, uh, spend the remaining 10 minutes finally getting towards some payoff. Uh, and the payoff uh, is whether you like it or not, uh, solving differential equations. Um, so let's uh, let's actually sort of um, let me actually jump forward a little bit, um, and uh, give you a sort of uh, idea of uh, of what we're going to do. So. Um, Oh, well, okay. There's, there'll be a word here that we just won't define until next week, but that's okay. Uh, there is a unique uh, weak solution. So weak is the name in this sense we haven't quite specified yet. So there 
there's some vague bits of this theorem that will fill in when we actually get there. But the point is that I'm thinking f here is some fixed function in some class, and now I'm looking for solutions u in some other class of functions. And the claim is that we can produce, uh, we can prove that there are unique, there exists a solution and it's unique. Well, it's a solution in this weak sense. Yeah. And the way we're going to do this is that uh, we'll consider a functional. On, let's just call this class curly H for a moment. Uh, we'll just consider some functional on the places where you might live, and we can just give it. Uh, let me just write it down. Uh, uh, this is all on uh, some uh, uh, some domain, and uh, so thinking like. Or something. Uh, so we're going to write down some crazy thing that takes a, a candidate solution okay and the, the claim is going to just be that uh, a minimizer uh, for this functional Must be a weak solution and a minimizer must exist. Okay, so it's going to take us until next week to actually go and think about sort of uh, this business of, of why. Uh, so, of, but by minimizer here, I just mean that, like, as you vary v over this space of, that these might live in. This just gives you some numbers. Uh, so we want to show that not a, that these g of these have some infimum, and the infimum is actually realized by some function in the class. Okay. So we'll defer until next week explaining the sorts of reasons why, from a, from a differential equation, you can often write down some functional so that minimizers must be weak solutions, push that into the future. Our job is now to understand sort of why minimizers uh, often, often exist. OK. I've lost all my pages now. Here we go. Okay, so, uh, well, the, the whole point of Banaka uh is that it, it, uh, it's for proving that minimizers exist. So, um, so say um, F uh, maps uh, X um, some, uh, some say, Reflexive Banach space uh, maps to the reals uh, is weakly continuous. And let's further say that uh, uh, that x goes to infinity as the f of x goes to infinity, as the norm of x goes to infinity. This sort of condition is very reasonable. Uh, like functionals like this, you can sort of see that as V is getting really big, probably this is blowing up as well because it's got lots of Vs in it. <laughs> um, so if we just had this situation, uh, then, well, what would be the, the point? Then, um, uh, uh, what do we get to say? So, um, now I'm going to look at some ball. Uh, sorry, let me can introduce why I wanted this condition here. Um, then, oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, then um, um, the point is that f is just bounded below. Some ball, okay, because um, uh, the fact that it's going to infinity means that uh, you can pick some radius and ensure that outside of that radius it's at least a million or whatever you want, okay, and so um, then it's just some um, um, yeah, okay, 
so we pick some balls so outside of which it's a, it's at least a million, and then um, no, sorry, what am I doing wrong here? I just want to use the fact that the the ball is weakly compact to see that f attains a minimum. Um, help me work out what this missing step is. Uh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so look at look at look at f somewhere. Okay, uh, just pick any 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 point at all and look at its value there. It's some finite number. Okay. Now pick a big enough ball so that outside of that ball we're surely bigger than that. Okay. Now if a minimum uh, if if a minimum appears, it appears inside the ball. So now we own, to minimize it, we only need to look on the on the ball of that finite radius. And then that ball of finite radius is weakly compact, so f attain actually actually achieves a minimum inside that ball, and we don't need to worry about the, there being an infimum that's not achieved somewhere outside the ball because outside the ball everything's already big. Okay, so um, um, so that is all well and good, uh, and it seems like a great plan for proving minimizers exist. But uh, nothing useful. His grief are continuous. <laughs> so we go home unhappy. Um, the let me I, okay. Let me give you one example, and then I'll just say the word that on Monday will get us out of this hole. So the example is just that even if you look at the norm function which is as continuous as you get, uh, and let's say we do it on a Hilbert space, is not weakly continuous. And this is just a feature of, of what we said before we started studying weak topologies. As you weaken the topology, fewer things become continuous. And it's, it's a really great cost. And the, the point is, uh, so here, if it were, uh, we could just look at the sphere, the unit sphere, Um, uh, and this would be closed, would be weakly closed, just because it's cut out by some supposedly weakly continuous function. Um, however, uh, you just look at the EIs, the, the usual orthonormal basis in, in your Hilbert space, and it's easy to see that that converges weakly to zero. So zero is in the net set. Okay, so it's just over. And so the, our salvation uh, will just be lower semi-continuous functions. And uh, the thing that we will prove, uh, in fact, pretty easily, is that the stuff we learned from Banakaloglu is enough to show that, uh, that weakly, weakly lower semi-continuous functions um, uh, achieve their minimums and, uh, and then to solve all these PDE things we're only going to have to show that our functionals which uh, pick out solutions are, um, are weakly continuous weakly, sorry, weakly semi-continuous uh, to, to get the existence of solutions so we'll do that on Monday do this on Wednesday and if we manage to get through that then I can just tell you random facts about C-star algebras and von Neumann algebras on Friday um, okay, sounds like a plan. See you then. <laughs>